We just finished week five, and the playoff picture is beginning to take shape. We had a lot of questions coming into this week, and teams gave us answers to open up the playoff projections debate. I've been getting a lot of heat on social media on where I have teams projected to go and what I have them seated at, where they're going, who they're going to, what their finishing record is. At the end of the day, <clears throat> they're projections. And if you look at my work over the past seven, eight seasons, we tend to be pretty much in the ballpark where they end up. But when we're doing it in week five, it's always the hardest week for, for one, because we're still four weeks out from when it's going to happen. Three or two, there's still some un instability within the teams that are playing at the current moment. Three, uh, you know, it's still high school football. You're dealing with teenage kids and, you know, it can be, you know, a girlfriend breaks up with them, a friend upsets them. Anything can change the demeanor that they have to change the focus that they have, which can throw into, you know, things that happen in high school sports that we see on a regular basis. However, as the weeks continue to progress, our playoff picture continues to get better with that. So keep that in mind as you keep going through and looking at these things. And the biggest thing I have to point out is, you know, the playoff projections and the seedings themselves are not based on who you played, what size schools you played, how tough you think you are. It's simply based on the fact that you have opponents on your schedule. Your opponent's wins equate into what they call playoff points. And your playoff points are what seed you after your overall wins. The next tiebreaker after playoff points is your defeated opponent's wins. So if you take a look at that, that's how you get seeded. It doesn't care where you're ranked in state. The IHSA gives two craps about your state ranking. It does not care who your schedule is. The IHSA doesn't set your schedule. It only takes a look at your wins, your losses, your opponent's wins, and then your defeated opponent's wins. And that's it. It's that simple. With that, stay tuned for later in the show as we deep dive a bigger look into the current playoff picture. I am your host, Kyle Kampmeyer. Let's recap week five right now. Need a fresh look for your home? Neff Paints, based in Warren, Illinois, is the local expert in interior and exterior painting, staining, and power washing. Serving Galena, Dubuque, Lake Carroll, Apple Canyon Lake, Lena, and beyond, Neff Paints uses premium products for lasting quality. Contact Skylar at 815-541-7338 for a free estimate and let your home shine inside and out. In eight-man action, Amboy took a trip south for a rematch with Ridgewood, and the Spartans walked away with a 34-22 win. While it doesn't negate Amboy from being a top-ranked team and a state title contender, it definitely inserted Ridgewood back into the tighter title contender conversation. Behind the legs of Gavin Franks and Roy Sandberg, the Spartans definitely took control of the game early and were able to maintain that pace throughout the game to hold on to the two-touchdown win. Amboy will get another big test this week with Flanagan Cornell Woodland as they hit the road once again, but it becomes smooth sailing after that for the Clippers. Ridgewood battled all game long to beat Amboy for the first time. A big game with Flanagan Cornell Woodland and an undefeated West Central team weighed ahead in weeks 8 and 9 respectively. The Spartans have fully injected themselves into the IFA fabric as a true title contender. Polo continues to beat opponents at alarming rates while only allowing 14 points on the season. The plus side, the Marcos are taking care of business on the ground with Gus Mumford, Noah Dewey, and JT Stevenson leading a three-back attack we are accustomed to seeing out of the Marcos. The trio have combined for 1,285 yards and 20 touchdowns on the ground on the season. The big test is this week in the Battle of the Blacktop with Milledgeville. 
West Carroll was brought back to reality after being bounced by Milledgeville 44 to nothing. The Thunder still have much to learn from this game and plenty of time to turn around the areas that need improvement. They can get back on track and clinch a playoff spot this week. Speaking of Milledgeville, the Missiles are off to a remarkable start. They've scored over 300 points. They've given up very few points in against their starting defense, and they continue to put up running clock after running clock after running clock. This week, in the Battle of the Blacktop, they're going to get their truest test they will see until the playoffs begin. They are the host, and over the past two years, Milledgeville has taken this game in the regular season dumping over 50 points per game in this big rivalry game. We'll see if that continues this week. Orangeville has picked up back-to-back wins, something I said a few weeks ago needed to happen to keep the Broncos in the playoff picture. The windows of opportunity have appeared to open up for the Broncos, but it still requires an upset win in Week 7 or Week 9. Unless another team stumbles... The Broncos need five wins to get in, as four wins will not get them in the playoffs. Hayden Schofield leads the Bronco attack as the sophomores rushed for over 1,250 yards through the first five games of the season. Across IFA, here are some other teams to keep your eyes on as the playoff picture begins to take shape. St. Thomas Morris storms back onto the scene, and the possibility of that 7-2 record potential I talked about last week looks to be more visible for the Sabres. Behind the passing game of Reed Craddock, who has 1,076 yards with 12 touchdowns, receivers Marty Devaney with 357 yards and 8 touchdowns, and Alex Huber, who has collected 313 yards and 3 touchdowns, the rushing attack of Peter Samu, who has rushed for 387 yards with two touchdowns, and quarterback Reed Craddock with 163 yards and eight touchdowns, they appear to be hitting their stride and picking up momentum entering the back half of the season. Martinsville continues to take down opponents at an alarming rate, and with a big win over South Fork, a projected playoff qualifier themselves, that leaves two teams, Pawnee and Milford Cisna Park, in the road between an undefeated regular season and a potential one seed for the Blue Streaks. Led by Adam Parcell and his 665 yards on the ground, coupled with Gabe Griffin, who has 370 yards and four touchdowns, and QB Caden Simons, who's rushed for 305 yards and seven touchdowns while throwing for 258 yards and seven touchdowns, the Blue Streaks look to make another long playoff run. The West Central Heat moved to 5 and 0 on the year, but now the real fun begins. A rematch with the hungry BPC team fighting to make the playoffs, followed by 3 consecutive weeks of top-ranked teams in FCW, Amboy, and Ridgewood will put the Heat to test. They are already in the playoffs, but one of the few remaining unbeaten teams that haven't been tested yet. FCW has been off to a great start this season. The next three weeks will test the medal of the Falcons as they square off with Amboy, West Central, and Ridgewood. On a safer note, barring any upsets, the Falcons will see themselves in the playoffs again this year. Led led by the play of Logan Ruddy, Leland Durbin, and Seth Jones on offense, combined with Durbin, Xander Ratke, and Aiden Ratke on defense, The Falcons' lone misstep came in Week 3 with Ridgewood. We will find out soon enough if they can return that favor. Pawnee has punched their ticket to the playoffs and will easily find themselves anywhere from 7-2 to 9-0 to finish the regular season. A couple big games on their schedule include Martinsville in Week 7 and MCP in Week 9. Carson Wart continues to be the workhorse for the Indians, and provided they can continue to give them room to work, along with other contributions coming out of the backfield and in the passing game, Pawnee is looking for a deep playoff run. By the way, Coach Tally, I am searching for your stats, so if you hear this, check your junk mail for an email from me, nuicfootball at gmail.com. St. Anne has taken IFA by surprise this year. 
a three and six season in their first go around as a self-standing program. The Cardinals are sitting at three wins through the first five weeks already this season. Led by Chris Link, who has rushed for over a thousand yards on the year. On defense, the Cardinals have received a lot of help from Dion Pfeiffer, Matthew Langlier, and Ben Harpster. The next three weeks should see St. Anne book their trip to the playoffs before a potential playoff level game in week nine with South Fork. Milford Cisna Park improved to four and one with a close win over St. Anne. The Bearcats, the Bearcats will punch their ticket to their sixth consecutive playoff appearance in IFA over the next two weeks before getting big matchups with Martinsville and Pawnee in weeks eight and nine. Dirks Newcomb, Caleb Cloutier, Skylar Este, and Mario Martinez drive this offense. The defense is anchored by Cloutier, Martinez, and Preston Jansen. MCP is setting themselves up for what they hope to be another big playoff season. On the 11-man front, Lena Winslow enters back into NUIC play after having a week off due to a forfeit. Will the week off help rest them and keep them ready? or get them out of sync. We will find out soon enough as they host Dupac in an NUIC showdown that could lead to a conference championship. The Rivermen left no doubt as they slaughtered Galena in a game that looked like it could have been a good one. However, Dupac sent Galena home in, the similar, fla- in similar fashion to last year as Cooper Hoffman threw for 144 yards, ran for 111 yards, and accounted for five touchdowns on the night. Lucas Rousseau and Dermot Dolan also broke free for 100 yards rushing on the ground with two touchdowns each, while Jackson Diedrich picked up 102 yards receiving with a touchdown for the Rivermen. EPC entered Stockton as a slight favorite and walked out as Superman with a decisive 34-8 win. The Wildcats started strong as Draven Zier busted free for a 64-yard touchdown run to open the scoring. He would cap the scoring for the Wildcats on the night with a matching 64-yard touchdown run in the third quarter on his way to a 211-yard three-touchdown performance. Adam Awender and Jackson Kemple continue to provide rushing options to keep the defense honest. EPC will have an easy week before the now highly anticipated matchup with Lena Winslow in Week 7 and a potential share of the conference title on the line. Stockton fell to 2-3 and three with last week's loss, but the Blackhawks are still very much a threat to the 1A field. They have three games in front of them they can win, but it won't come easy. Behind their rushing attack, they will need to find more consistency as they need to string a couple wins together to remain in the playoff hunt. Morrison has a shot at getting to 3-3 this week as they play host to Dakota. However, the last three weeks will need to be knocked down, drag out brawls, so to speak, with Stockton, EPC, and Fulton lurking in the same positions. They need to get the passing game behind Colton Bielema going, along with the run game of Rylan Alvarado and Brady Anderson to complement Donnie Reavy in order to have a more balanced attack to get back in the playoffs. Fulton turned away Dakota at the goal line twice, stifling what could have been a halftime deficit to the Indians and turned a 16-6 lead into a 45-6 victory. Dom Kramer was the difference maker as he was able to break free on two first half touchdown runs on backside QB keepers to exploit the Dakota defense. Josiah Held was a force on the defensive line, almost single handedly tearing up his side of the ball. The Steamers have no easy walk as they need to get three wins over the next four weeks to punch their ticket to the playoffs. It starts this week with a tough opponent in Galena at Chuck Cordy Field. We'll break down our week's matchups for week six coming up next. In IFA action, Amboy enters this game at 4-1 and one as they go on the road to Flanagan to play Flanagan Cornell Woodland, who matches their record at 4-1. and one. Amboy suffered their first loss since the 2022 state championship game against West Central. The Clippers also entered their 17-game win streak in last week's loss. Now, they get the opportunity to get back on track. 
The Clippers couldn't get the run game going, which has been a vital part of their offense all season. On top of that, they didn't find much success in the air either, creating a perfect storm for Ridgewood to capitalize for the big upset win. Now, another playoff team lurks with Flanagan Cornell Woodland looking to get their first notable win on the year. Amboy needs to have Braden Klein, Quinn Luffelman, and Josh McKendry at full power, and the defense needs to fire off the ball faster than they did last week. FCW will have Seth Jones, Leland Durbin, and Logan Ruddy looking to exploit and attack the Clipper D and put some points on the scoreboard. River Ridge hits the road as they take on AFC. The Wildcats enter this game at 1-4, while the Raiders enter this game at 0-5. It has been a hard season for both teams. River Ridge can take advantage of a depleted AFC team and continue to build on to what this young team has done to this point. Damon Dittmer has been the huge bright spot for the Wildcats and a big reason why River Ridge is in the position that they're in and capable of getting some more wins before the season ends. Orangeville travels to Hiawatha in a big game for the Broncos as they enter this contest at 2-3. and three while Hiawatha enters at 1-4. The Hawks have scored 24 points on the season. Orangeville still has an outside chance of making the playoffs, but they need this win against Hiawatha to keep that dream alive. Hayden Schofield has been the guy for the Broncos, rushing for over 1,250 yards on the season as the current rushing leader in IFA. The line up front with Nathan Briggs, Blake Comprude, and company need to be firing off the ball and continue to improve their play as they look to get back to the playoffs. There is a lot of work to do and time to build on to make that dream a reality. West Carolina's this game at 4-1 and one as they suffered their first loss of the season last year, and they hit the road to Rockford to play Christian Life, who enters this game at 1-4. and four. The, suffered thunder, the Thunder suffered their first loss last week against state title contender Milledgeville. On the short side of it, West Carroll realized what it will take to get to that next level of eight-man football. On the long side of it, this was a great learning experience for a team that hasn't seen much success on the gridiron to continue to build on as they look to book their way into the 2024 playoffs. The Thunder playoff shirts will begin development after this week. Our eight-man game of the week is brought to you by Best Realty. Best Realty has been helping Northern Illinois tackle their real estate needs since 1990. Whether you're buying or selling in the market for residential, commercial, or acreage, they'll help you get the best deal. Call the Best Realty team at 815-248-3408 or visit them online at bestrealtyproperties.com. Our Best Realty Game of the Week takes us to the Battle of the Blacktop where Polo hits the road to take on Milledgeville. Both teams will enter this game at 5-0. It is always a great time to visit Milledgeville during football season. The perfect setting along Route 40, the big missile in front of the school, and the victory bell on top of the hill. One of the best places for a pork chop sandwich, too. Now, it is time for the Battle of the Blacktop as the Missiles host the Marcos. The Missiles have beat the Marcos in the regular season each of the last two seasons, scoring 54 points and 58 points respectively. However, when it comes to the postseason, the Marcos have lasted longer, even upsetting the Missiles last year on their way to another semifinal appearance to get the last laugh. Polo has had a very balanced attack with Noah Dewey, Gus Mumford, and J.T. Stevenson running the ball in an option attack offense. Millage will play tight. They'll also go spread, mixing up ways to get the ball in the hands of Spencer Nye, Carter Livingood, Connor Johnson, and Micah Tom Smith. Freshman QB Kyson Francis has put up video game-like numbers since stepping in, but this will be the first test of the season in this big-time showdown featuring the number one and number two ranked teams in the state. 
Get your blankets, chairs, etc., as you won't want to miss this epic showdown on Friday night in Milledgeville. This portion of our broadcast is brought to you by Diedrich Epoxy Flooring. Serving Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, Diedrich Epoxy is the source for all of your epoxy needs. Give Diedrich Epoxy Flooring a call today at 815-239-1158 for your free estimate. Moving over to NUIC action, Dakota hits the road for the second week in a row as they travel down to Morrison. The Indians enter this game at 0-5 while Morrison enters at 2-3. Dakota had opportunities to score on Fulton in their first two possessions, but penalties ultimately turned them away. When Drake Davis connected with Braxton Niedermeyer towards the end of the first half last Friday, the Indians finally ended their scoring drought. A first half that saw Dakota moving the ball up and down the field turned into three and outs and limited ball possession in the second half, however. This week, they get another shot to redeem themselves and continue to show their improvements over the season. Morrison is hungry to get back in the playoffs, but with Dupec on schedule, there is no time to be waiting on miracles. They need to make their work happen now. If they can get Rylan Alvarado and Brady Anderson going on the outside with Donnie Reavy wreaking havoc between the tackles, it could prove to be the recipe the Mustangs need to turn the second half of the season into their favor. Forston is the host as they have Stockton coming to town this week. The Blackhawks enter this game with a 2-3 and three record while Forston enters at 1-4. Stockton is coming off another tough loss, but the Blackhawks have a lot of youth to build upon, only having two seniors on the team. One thing Stockton has not done this season is lose back-to-back games. The preseason talk about being a team to watch has held its weight, but they have to get the offense going and improve the defense to maintain the high-level play they have shown over the course of the season. There is no need to hit that panic button as the back half of the season has been in Stockton's favor. They just need to capitalize on the opportunity in front of them. Forreston is not out of it yet, but games against Dupec and Lena Winslow to close out the season, the Cards backs are pinned against the wall. The 13-year playoff streak is very much in jeopardy, and this is the time where you begin to lay the message of playing for pride, ruin someone else's fun, and look to spoil the apple cart of the playoff picture. Fulton travels to Glean on a big NUIC tilt as both teams enter at 2-3. and three. If it weren't for the Lena winslow Dupec game this week, this game could arguably be a favorite for the game of the week. Both teams can still afford one more loss, and someone will walk away with that L but both teams feature a dual option attack. Roman Romer and Miles Schumacher have been the stalwarts in the Pirate offense this season. They need to take advantage of opportunities the Steamers present and attack them. Defensively, stop number four. Dom Kramer has been carrying the Steamer offense all season. His ability to run play fakes to open up backside keepers have been a key to their success. Mixing the ability to get the ball to Braden Myers and Jacob Housen gain the passing game, the Steamers have the ability to attack quickly. With Josiah held back on the line, it also gives Fulton another big point of attack on defense. Chuck Cordy Field will be rocking in this one. EPC plays host to Westmont as the Sentinels enter this game at 1-3 and, and EPC sits at 4-1. and one. We might as well call this game what it is. The stamp to booking EPC's return to the playoffs for the first time since 2018. The Cats face a far inferior opponent in the Sentinels. Draven Zier, Jackson Kempel, Adam Awender and company should have, ha- should have this one over by the end of the first quarter. If they don't, They better gas it up in the second quarter to get it finished off. Start printing those playoff t-shirts, EPC fans. Our 11-man game of the week is brought to you by Best Realty. Best Realty has been helping Northern Illinois tackle their real estate needs since 1990. Whether you're buying or selling, in the market for residential, commercial, or acreage, they'll help you get the best deal. Call the Best Realty team at 815-248-2000. 
888-345-3408 or visit them online at bestrealtyproperties.com. Our best reality game of the week takes us to Lena, where the Lena Wessel Panthers will play host to the Dupec Rivermen. Both teams enter this game perfect at 5-0. If you throw week one out of the window, Dupec has just allowed 21 points over the past four weeks, including a decisive win over an up-and-coming team in the EPC. Cooper Hoffman has been the highlight reel for the Rivermen, and as any scouting report would indicate, you need to shut down number three to shut down Dupec. Dermot Dolan, Justin Anderson, and Lucas Rousseau have been helping in the rushing attack, while Jordan Gassman, Brody Black, and Jackson Deidre continue to be big targets in the passing game. On the other side of the ball are the Panthers. And with Coburn Lynch back on the field to complement Jalen Rakowska, Aiden Wild, and Alex Schlichting, it provides a little more punch to an already fast and explosive backfield. This game will have all the stars, the bright lights, and back in black playing on the sound system as Lena Winslow looks to extend its regular season game win streak to 24 wins. This is the game of the year in the NUIC. Our NUICfootball.com state rankings are presented by Leading Edge Fundraising. If you need to raise funds for new uniforms, tournament expenses, equipment, or more, look no further. Brandon Sharp at Leading Edge makes it easy for you and your team to have a fun and competitive way to raise funds for your program. Give Brandon a call today at 563-514-1647. Leading Edge Fundraising, your premier fundraising company. Let's take a look at our NUICfootball.com state rankings. We'll just roll through them real quick. Starting in eight man, our new number one this week are the Milledgeville Missiles as they improve to 5-0. Followed by number two, their opponent for this week, the Polo Marcos, as they are also perfect at 5-0. Coming in, entering at number three is Ridgewood after their upset win over Amboy. And following at number four are the Clippers as they drop from number one to four. At number five is Martinsville. Number six is Pawnee. And number seven is West Central as all three teams remain undefeated uh, through five weeks. At number eight is FCW at four and one. Number nine is Milford Cisna Park at four and one. And rounding out the top ten is South Beloit at four and one. Other teams receiving votes include West Carroll, South Fork, St. Anne, and St. Thomas More. Moving into Class 1A, at number one is Altoff Catholic at five and zero, oh, followed by Lena Winslow at number two. Number three is Calhoun. And moving up to number four is Leroy, as all three of those teams remain undefeated on the season. At number five is Camp Point Central at four and one. And at number six is Newman Central Catholic, as they improve to four and one. Jumping up to number seven are the Rebels of Stark County, as they are five and oh. And dropping down to number eight after their loss last week to Calhoun is Greenfield Northwestern at four and one. At number nine is GCMS. And at number 10 is Casey Westfield. Both those teams are undefeated on the year. Other teams receiving votes include Aurora Christian, Stockton, Galena, Rockford Lutheran, and Cesar Valier. In Class 2A, the number one team remains the same as it has since the start of the season, and that is Moroa Forsyth at 5-0. Coming in at number two is Quincy Notre Dame at 4-1, and and at number three is Farmington at 5-0. At number four is Tri-Valley as the Vikings are 4-1. and one. Number five is Johnston City at 5-0. and oh. At number six is Chester as the Yellow Jackets are 5-0. and oh. Entering at number seven is Chicago Christian at 4-1. and one. Number eight is Bloomington Central Catholic at 3-2. and two. Number nine is Eastland Pearl City at 4-1. and one. And at number 10 is Rockridge at 3-2. and two. Other teams receiving votes include Moments. Bismarck Henning, Rossville Allen, Shelbyville, Pena, and Vandalia. And in Class 3A, the number one team remains the same. Byron, as the Tigers are undefeated at 5-0. At number two is Montini Catholic at 3-2. Number three is Wilmington at 5-0. At number four is St. Joseph Ogden at 5-0. 
And moving their way up to number five this week is Monmouth Roseville after their big win over Princeton as they improve to 5-0. and At number six is Dupac. At number seven is Seneca. Those two teams meet up in week eight. That will be a great showdown to watch. Both those teams currently undefeated at 5-0. and At number eight is Williamsville at 4-1. and Number nine is Princeton after they fall from number four down to nine at four and one. And rounding out the top ten is Paxton Buckley Loda at five and zero. Oh. Other teams receiving votes are Monticello and Eureka. That gives you a look at our NUICfootball.com state rankings. We'll take a look at the playoff picture coming up next. All right, taking a look at the playoff picture and taking a look also at Steve Susie's playoff projections and what he's put out for the week as well. One of the things I've noticed and he makes a, a statement about as well is the misunderstandings of how the bubble works. There is no set classification in high school football until all 256 teams are placed into the field. Once the 215, 256 teams are set, then you can start from the highest enrolled school down to the lowest enrolled school or vice versa. doesn't matter which way you go, but you got to start from the lowest to the highest or highest to the lowest to make your playoff field. So as teams win and lose, and kind of shift that bubble around, you begin to see how it affects other teams and where they land. So one of the biggest questions I've been receiving on our front for the NUIC is, can EPC make it into 1A? Can DUPEC make it into 2A? The answers are most likely not, but... Both teams are getting extremely close to that edge. Um, when you took a look at the rankings to start the year, the projected cutoffs were pretty low for the year. Uh, if you take a look at last year, in fact, the um, final cutoff for Class 1A was at 299. The start of the year, the AP poll, why you see teams that are ranked in 3A or 2A and are being projected into Class 1A or 2A, is simply for the fact that the state rankings are based off of a preseason projection. That way they can somewhat identify what the classification range is going to be. With that said... The classification cutoff for Class 1A this year started at 287.5. And then it moved up to 387 for Class 2A and 520 for Class 3A. Well, as the season has progressed and some of the teams that we thought would be projected into the playoffs are either not going to make the playoffs or are on the outside of the playoff picture looking in, it really starts to make those projections begin to move. Now, you got to remember, projections are simply objective based on what people see. So, for instance, when I do my projections, people always think that I'm just picking teams to win or lose. And in some cases, that may be true because it's easy to pick. However, I use the Freeman ratings. I take a look at where teams are rated compared to other teams. And then I'll also do score comparisons. I'll take a look at points allowed, points scored, the point differential between those two. And or I'll just run a simple score projection using either Cal Preps or the Massey rating system. With that, that's how I determine who is projected to win. So when people say, well, how can you pick this team to win and that team to lose or whatever? Guys, I'm not really picking anything. I am projecting teams where I feel they're going to be. And at the same time, 
Somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. It's just that damn simple. So in reality, if you want to be in the picture where you think you should be, you got to go out and prove it. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. People like myself, Steve Soucy, Greg and Mitch at View from the West, you know, we can sit here and we can tell you things. We can talk about things all day long. We can project things on what we see, what the playoff picture looks like. Whatever. We can do whatever we want to do based off of the information that we have. You know, I'm very statistical based. I like to take a look at stats and analyze them and analyze them and analyze them. I'm just I'm I'm a numbers guy. I crunch numbers. It's what I love to do. And with that, you start to see where teams tend to project that. You can take a look at common scores. But you also got to take a look at matchups in different ways, too. And sometimes you got to look at rivalry games. You know, believe it or not, you, you see a lot of times where teams are big rivalries and they get up and give the, a team that you feel should be uh, the runaway winner a really big game. And that changes how things are a lot in the playoff picture. We've seen it many times over the years where we're getting into week nine, two teams are four and four, one team's projected to be in, they're the heavy favorites as well. And all of a sudden the team that you thought was going to be four and five is the team that wins. They're in the playoffs. And now it's throwing a complete crapshoot in the whole thing, shifting things around, bumping teams around. It, it's just, it is, it's a big difference on how things work. Um, with that said, you know, I'm trying to keep this nice and polite and easy to give you guys a look into the playoffs. Um, right now, taking a look at how the playoff field is looking. Another answer I get is I didn't know four and five teams were making the playoffs. Well, truth be told, since COVID, our number of playoff eligible teams playing at the 11 man level has significantly dropped. Some of that is due to teams falling out from 11 man after the 2019 season and really after the COVID season to join eight man football. So there is a little bit of slight relationship there, but I get asked the question too. Well, wouldn't that change the way that the cutoffs are? And to answer that question, there has not been a lot of relativity between teams from 11-man jumping to 8-man and the cutoffs for each classification. If you take a look at the averages over the past few years, like pre-8-man football, the Class 1A average for like the last 15 years was at 308.5 over the past three seasons with eight man football in full effect. The average class classification cutoff is at 311. So what, what can handle that? Well, in 2019, our great state of Illinois and IHSA decided to allow waivers to happen in an every two year cycle to private schools. So what that means is when a private school does not win three playoff games in a two-year enrollment cycle, they're going to be put into the field that they would fall into at their original enrollment. So that's why you see a lot of teams, private schools in lower classes like Montini Catholic, Chicago Hope, Sterling Newman, Altoff Catholic. You have a lot of these teams playing in classifications that they don't belong in because they are playing on waivers because they have not had the success at the playoff level to give them the multiplier. And that multiplier changes every two years now. It used to be a six-year window. Now it's a two-year window. So that's how that's translated. That's why you see the different shifts in the enrollment cycles. And of course, the COVID year really threw that all off as well. Now, another thing you got to keep in mind when you're taking a look at the playoff picture is the Chicago Public League. The blue divisions are only allowing the conference champions to get into the playoffs, whereas the white divisions and the red division are allowing teams that make the playoffs 
through their point systems and win totals into the playoffs. So that's going to be a little bit of a change as well because you got to you got to consider that when you're taking a look at what they have. So realistically, um 26 Chicago Public League teams qualified for the playoffs last year. And right now we're probably projecting around 20 to 22 making it from class 1A to 8A this year. So with that said, the amount of five win teams also getting into the playoffs is going to be higher, which also is going to turn up the amount of four and five teams that we're going to get into the playoffs. Right now, you could see anywhere from 10 to 12 four win teams make the playoffs. At the beginning of the year, we are looking anywhere from 12 to 15. As of like a week or two ago, it was down to six, and now it's back up to like that 10 to 12 window. So there's there, there's there's a lot of moving back and forth right now. There is a lot of parity among high school football at the moment, which is creating some of that as well. So when you take a look at the playoff picture, you know, you got to take a look at many different things. Obviously, I put out my playoff brackets. Um, realistically, you know, taking a look at what I wanted to see, you know, starting an eight-man football, we'll just start there. Their, their path is a little bit different. So in eight-man football, you have your wins. Then you have your head-to-head -head competition is your first tiebreaker. After head-to-head -head competition, then it goes to playoff points. So it's a little bit different from 11-man football, whereas in 11-man football, it goes wins, opponents' wins, which are playoff points, and then defeated opponents' wins. So that's one of the things I like about the eight-man playoff structure is that they put an emphasis on not just wins record-wise, but head-to-head -head wins. So if you got two teams, Team A and Team B, Team A has a better uh, schedule, Team B beats Team A, Team B has fewer playoff points because of their lesser schedule, but because Team B beat Team A, Team B is going to get the higher seed. So that, that's what's fun about the eight-man game and how they do it. Like I said, they really emphasize that um, win marker. For the um, eight-man side, you know, teams that are really starting to shape up and look like potential title contenders that we can see making it to Monmouth, Milledgeville, Right now is projected to go nine and zero. Um, Saint Anne has had some games that have really started to show that they could be a potential team to watch out for come the playoffs. Same with Saint Thomas More, but Saint Thomas More has been in that picture since twenty twenty one. Amboy is another team that really has uh, shown out. They are the defending state champs. Have been to the state championship in back to back seasons. So not only do they have that experience under their belt, but they also have that play level and ability to make it back down the road as well. Pawnee is a team who hasn't had a whole lot of playoff success, but they have definitely um, put together a great opportunity to see more playoff success this year and definitely look like a true title contender. One team I never leave out, regardless of record, is Milford Cisna Park. Uh, Coach Schwartz down there does a great job with the Bearcats. You know, they're they're one of the founding members of the IFA. They've always been in the playoffs, and they always seem to be a team that can give other teams a lot of fits. So, you know, it never it never care where they finish record wise. If they're in the field, they're a team I'm looking at. Martinsville came off of a semifinal run last year. You know, last week they had a big win over uh, South Fork. That really turned a lot of heads. Um, wasn't really sure. Knew Martinsville would be strong. Wasn't sure at 
what level of strength they would truly be at, but they're really starting to show that they're a team to really take a look at when we get into the playoffs. Ridgewood, last year state runner-up, obviously had the big staple win this week as they beat Amboy for the first time. So like last year, you know, we, we, we knew that if Ridgewood could get separated from where Polo and Amboy were at in the playoff picture, that they would have a high possibility of making a run to Monmouth, and they did. Uh, this year, you know, they definitely look even more prepared to make another run back to Monmouth. And then Polo. Polo obviously being at eight and one, a team that's made the semifinals or further every year that they've been in IADFA. Uh, they continue to do things that we see on a regular basis. Um, and this week is going to be their first true test when they get to take on uh, Milledgeville in the Battle of the Blacktop game. Class 1A, right now, my projected cutoff is at 304.5. And if you look at Steve Susie's, their cl his Class 1A projection is at 303. So as far as that is concerned, we're both relatively in the same ballpark there. Um, some teams of note are Leroy. Uh, looking at them uh, right now, both my projections and Susie's projections show Leroy going into the north bracket. Last year, they were in the south bracket. They lost in the second round to Altoff Catholic. This year, they moved north, potentially, which could throw a big... Uh, issue into the north bracket for other teams as they look to be a very strong team obviously partnered up with lena winslow uh stark county is showing to be relatively tougher this year as well uh hope academy their record doesn't show it but they've played a relatively strong schedule and one of the teams that i i have in 1a and that's a team that i've been questioning on and definitely a team that could create problems in the 1A field if they get there, regardless of whatever record they end up at, is Bloomington Central Catholic. So you, you're going to want to watch out for those teams. Another team to definitely keep an eye on is a team like Stockton, where they haven't they have to make it in yet. They're only two and three right now, so they're on the outside looking in, but they have a favorable sec second half of the schedule. So provided they can win, their losses are to three state-ranked teams across 1A, 2A, and 3A. So um, you can't take a look at Stockton and be like, oh, they're not that good because they're going to they're gonna surprise you. And then, of course, GCMS, the two-time uh, two A state champions from a few years ago, have definitely turned things around for uh, the one A uh, North bracket. In the South Side, Calhoun's running the show at nine and zero. Altoff Catholic is projected to be nine and zero, and Camp Point Central is looking at finishing at eight and one. Some other teams are in there. Casey, Casey Westfield has a long history of having deep playoff runs. Um, not not so much recently. Over the last few years, uh, as the Little Illini Conference has gotten extremely weak, uh, making it a very easy schedule for the Warriors to get to that 9-0 mark. But still a team you want to watch out for. Cesar Valero will be 9-0, but the Black Diamond Conference has a feudal history of playoff success, so don't expect them to get very far. In my opinion, 1A South is going to run through three teams, Calhoun, Camp Point Central, and Altoff Catholic. In Class 2A, I have the bracket set up to where the cutoff is at 421.5. And when I take a look at uh, Susie's, He's got it at 418.5. So once again, you know, we're, we're right in the same ballpark there. Um, obviously, in the north, the team that is really standing out is that of Wilmington. They are the defending 2A state champs, projected to go 9-0 and on the year. Um, they're going to fall. They're, they're currently ranked in Class 3A, have been all year. They're going to drop down into 2A most likely, which is most expected. Farmington's had a great year at 9-0. Another team I've been keeping my eye on is Chicago Christian. 
out of the Chicago Land Christian Conference. They are eight and one. You have Tri Valley in there, eight and one, who has had some recent state level success over the past ten years. And then Seneca is another team that is looking at dropping down from three A into class two A. Another team to watch for is also Bismarck Henning, Rossville Allen, as they are looking to be undefeated, and they are a team that usually goes north or south. They're looking to bump into that north bracket. And then a surprise team this year that was one of our teams to keep an eye out for is Eastland Pearl City. Currently in the power ratings, they are rated number four in Class 2A and are really showing themselves to be a team that could create some havoc in that 2A north bracket. Uh, in the south, you know, it's a lot of familiar faces. Moreau Forsyth at 9-0 and uh, projected-wise. Quincy Notre Dame is another team as they've moved into the Central State 8 as a team to watch out for this year. Thought they would be last year as they entered the playoffs at 4-5. and five. This year they move into an actual harder conference and they're just running the show uh, fairly well there. Um, so they, they look to be ready for a deep playoff run. Uh, another team of relative surprise this year has been Chester as well, as right now they're projected to finish at 8-1, and one, but they look like they could potentially make some noise in the 3A South bracket, or 2A South bracket. Finally, in Class 3A, I have the cutoff projected at 572.5, and when I take a look at Susie's projections, he also has the same cutoff with Richmond Burton being the uh, team to drop down into uh, 3A from 4A. And if you remember correctly, Richmond Burton was the team that won the Class 4A state championship just a few years ago. They continue to have a declining enrollment, and as the teams continue to move up, you know, a lot of those four-win teams we're talking about making the playoffs are teams that are coming from uh, private schools, in the Chicago Catholic League or schools that play an independent schedule because they're allowed to have more room to garner more playoff points. What is that playoff point cutoff at right now? Um, you know, I would say comfortably you need to be to that 50 to 54 range if you're a four win team. Right now, projected wise, we're looking about 46, 47 points is what's going to be needed for a four win team to make the playoffs. And there's going to be some teams that are going to be in that 46 to 47 range. And out of the 12 teams that are going to make the four win cut, only seven of them, six, seven of them may get in. So it's going to, it's definitely going to be tight. And those playoff points are definitely going to come into play and make a big picture for the show. Um, teams to watch out for in 3A. We talked about it all year. Montini Catholic is a team that, uh, if they can get in, they're going to get in. They, they, they can get in with four wins. They're one of the teams that can get in with four wins, but they're going to have to uh, – they're going to be right on that bubble of getting in even with four wins. So they they may have to get that fifth win, and it's going to be tough. But if they get into that playoff field, they're definitely going to be a state title contender in that 3A North bracket. Dupex and other teams that, that has been showing fairly strong all season long. So it'll be interesting to see what they have. I don't think they're going to match up with a Montini Catholic or Byron at the level that they need to in order to win a state title, but they can definitely play some <clears throat> have they can definitely get some havoc in there. And that, you know, that's one of the things this past week, you know, everybody was like, Oh, you got Dupac rated number one. How do you got them there? Oh my God. Well, here's the thing. If they were to win out, I deep dived even further uh, through doing projections. And if the big northern opponents that are non-conference opponents all play to the caliber that they're supposed to play to, and the NUIC opponents for their non-con opponents do the same thing, Originally, I had Dupec finishing with one point higher than Byron. That has now reversed. Byron would be the expected one seed if they go undefeated. So that Dupec-Montini potential matchup in round one could actually be a Byron-Montini matchup in round one, as a lot of rumors have been talking about since the beginning of the year. 
Uh, obviously, other teams to watch for are Princeton, as they've been up in the uh, top rankings most of the year. And now Monmouth Roseville's really stormed down to the scene as well as a team to watch out for as they just throttled Princeton this past week. Down in the South, St. Joe Ogden looks to be uh, the potential one seed down there. They've been doing uh, great work all season long. Other teams to watch out for, uh, you know, Mount Carmel is the team that made it to state last year. They're projected to be six and three. Williamsville is a recent team with a lot of good history that could definitely make a good run. New Berlin is in there as a potential opportunity to make a good run. We'll see how that all translates. But Monticello is another team to watch out for. They were recently a state champion uh, about five, six years ago. They, too, are starting to revive and get back towards the top of the Illini Prairie. They are going to be another team to watch. And then DuCoin. You know, we usually see DuCoin do good things in the playoffs. They're right back in the mix once again. So that gives you a quick look at some teams I'm looking at. Gives you a little bit of a look of how the playoff picture works and the projections work. Um, Figured it'd be easier just to put it on here, tell you guys here how that all goes down. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that part. And uh, we'll continue with our playoff projections as we move forward. That gives you a look at our NUIC Week 6 preview. A lot of big games. Once again, we got some big game of the year matchups going on in Milledgeville and Lena this week. We have other games that are going to be huge as far as the playoff picture is concerned. If you stuck around till now, you already know that. Um, But as we continue to move forward, Get out to those games. Enjoy those Friday night lights. The fall temperatures are starting to kick in, which makes it a lot more fun and comfortable. As always, root for the NUIC.